architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash and you are yet once again listening to Architecture Talk. Each week we try and have a conversation to advance the frontier of architectural thinking and that is certainly something we are going to be doing today. In my conversation with University of Washington Assistant Professor Radhika Govindarajan who has recently published a fantastic book on uh, interspecies encounters called Animal Intimacies of the Time and work she spent uh, working with the communities of northern India. We take on a broad range of topics and try and connect them to architecture, including human-animal relationships, uh, the architecture that surrounds that, and sacrifice. I think you're going to enjoy this conversation. Let's go. Well, first of all, welcome to Architecture Talk. Thank you. So we are talking about your book called Animal Intimacies, in which you talk about interspecies relatedness, mm -hmm. or really interspecies intimacy, as intimated by the title of your book. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me the movement, the movement from relatedness to intimacies, we could get very intimate. And you do have a chapter on, on bears. Mm -hmm and bears and and it seemed from my reading of the quick reading of the chapter that there wasn't actual sexual contact between the women and the bears it was more the sort of empowerment and constructions of uh, women's uh, uh, sexual identities through it seemed to me fantasies with the bears but that's not the same as actual bestiality right mm -hmm. so you know, I think it's hard to, the very category of bestiality, mm. right, is such a modern one and mm. comes through the law. Uh, no. um, I think it's interesting to think through what kinds of um, sexual encounters mm -hmm. with animals are considered kosher and which ones are considered beyond the law. Right. And so if you think about, there's a very interesting historian called Gabriel Rosenberg, uh -huh. who um has written this book called The 4-H Harvest, and he's been writing a lot recently about uh, the ways in which animal reproduction mm -hmm. on farms involves a lot of sex work. Yes, of course. Yes, that's and right. That's that right. kind of sex work is protected by the law and uh -huh. enshrined as part of the process of farming. Right. And yet bestiality right. is figured as something else. Right. It's figured as something depraved. It's right. figured as something that uh, is inhuman. Right. And so I find those kinds of categorical uh, separations interesting. Interesting means what? I mean, why is this interesting? To me, the question of is there actual sex or not mm -hmm. is less interesting than what uh, sex talk about bears does and what kinds of possibilities it opens up. Uh, so it's hard, as I point out in the book, to judge the veracity of these tales. Um, people there certainly thought of them as true. They didn't think of them as folk tales or urban legends. Mm -hmm. Every woman I talked to said that it was somebody in the next village who this had happened to, you know, the children were, the half bear, half human children were born in a hospital in Almora or in Inital or some other small town. So there was a kind of specificity to these stories that I found interesting. And I wasn't, uh, I wasn't invested in following those up to see if they were true or not, but really thinking through what kind of work they did. What I found really compelling about the bear stories was not just that women were able to use sex with bears to try and make claims on their families, on their husbands, um, to push back against patriarchal structures, but also for what kind of desire was imagined. Right. right. Uh, and I think that the that the stories, particularly the tellings in which young women who were not actually using these stories to push back against patriarchal expectations yet, but were thinking through them for pleasure. Mm -hmm. And I write about this young woman, Asha. Right, was, right, um, right. So very married. forward. Very forward. Yes. Yes, it was It was quite surprising for me, actually, yes, how yes, forward she yes. was. But yeah, I, you, you used the phrase, I was very taken by her. 
my I read that first as I was taken aback by her. Then I went back and read it. No, you said you were taken by her. Yeah, I was. I was. <laughs> she was. She's a very captivating individual. She yeah. was um, very playful, mm-hmm. and uh, she kept drawing us back to that mm. conversation in ways that I found really mm. uh, taking, right, captivating. Yeah. And so she um, was always. Why was that captivating? Because many of the For tellings you. that I'd heard until then yeah. were thinking were about the pleasure but they were also about you know uh, shaming husbands for their lack of desire or uh, mm. shaming husbands for the ways in which they shame their wives yeah, yeah. for their Remember, desire yeah, and so, so on and this pushing was pushing back on patriarchy you said right and there was uh, very little of that in Asha's telling of course that was a broader context in which this was occurring but she really wanted to talk about what sex with a bear would be like and it was a really fun conversation it was fun to see her imagine these outlandish things. It was uh, shocking in many moments. Yeah. Right? We were all sort of gasping with laughter, but also almost embarrassed by the frankness of her conversation. Almost embarrassed? It was, you know, or, the embarrassed, but yes. there were, I was on the verge of embarrassment, torn between my own desire to sort of take her seriously, but also embarrassed about having this conversation and not knowing quite how to respond in this setting where this conversation is not always standard yeah yeah um and so it was just it was fun to be around her fun to see it's very transgressive isn't it it is um and i want to be careful about not sort of emphasizing the transgressive nature of this too much because there is sex talk there is a lot of sex talk you know um women will talk about sex with their boyfriends their husbands sex in general but this much pleasure in sex with a bear down to the minute details was really unexpected. Unexpected. And that's what made it so entertaining and so captivating. Mm-hmm. And she just, you know, this is, some of some of it is his personality. Asha had a very captivating personality. Um, but that, that was what really got me thinking about the other kinds of work that these stories were doing. Right. And I started paying more attention to those details in women's stories where they would dwell for a second on the fact that the bear loved these women so much that, right. that he would lick their the soles of their feet. Right, right, right. right? And why that level of detail? Right. Um, and what work does that detail do when yeah, you yeah. could just say very simply, a bear took a woman, had sex with her, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then Ooh. released her. But what there was just... Rest of its affect. Yeah, there was a wealth of detail there that yeah. I found. So let's zoom back out mm-hmm. since we have started the podcast by going deep into detail in sort of one yes. aspect <laughs> <laughs> unexpectedly mm-hmm. of, uh, of your research. So you talk about interspecies relatedness. Mm-hmm. You quote Donna Haraway quite extensively and mm-hmm. many others. Mm-hmm. But Donna Haraway I know a little bit about so I can connect there. Yeah. And you describe uh, this concept of relatedness, picking up from Haraway, as the myriad ways in which the potential and outcome of life unfolds in relation to that of another. Mm -hmm. And here, another is not just you and me, interhuman, but it is interspecies, Mm -hmm. in particular animals and people. Mm -hmm. But it could also, I imagine, be plants and people, or plants and animals and sort of the whole spectrum of interrelatedness yeah. across species, mm-hmm. correct? Yeah. Why is this important? I mean, why is this suddenly such a big topic for you uh, and in uh, theory, cultural theory nowadays? So what is the significance? I think the, the distinction between nature and culture, human and other, has yeah. been used for so long in formations of race and gender and sex and yeah. so I think that this questioning of um, these boundaries emerged actually very early in the work of critical race theorists mm-hmm. and in the work of feminist theorists who were trying to understand why it is that the natural yeah. was such a fertile site upon which to draw etch these boundaries yeah, yeah, yeah. of racial and sexual difference right and so in a way I think the seeds for what is this sudden flourishing yeah. of interest in the non-human have been laid well before for that. a long time yeah. I mean if you read someone like Franz Fanon yeah, he's very attentive to the fact that colonialism is predicated on the animality of the colonized right. and he writes a lot about the zoological metaphors of the colonizer mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, the reptilian stench of the natives is one phrase he sure. picks up sure. from the colonial sure. record and yeah, so yeah, I yeah. think that that interest in how animality 
um, race and gender are connected. Right. Is something that goes back along. Right. And so there's uh, that kind of early history for the field. Mm. And then if you look at the work of, say, someone like Donna Haraway, mm -hmm. she comes to her questions from that mm -hmm. broader interest. Mm -hmm. So her uh, cyborg manifesto right. looks at exactly those questions about what kinds of distinctions does right. the, the investment in the human allow for right. and what might undoing the, the coherence of the human as a category do right. for thinking through these other ways. Right, right. Um, so what so, does it do? What does undoing the coherence of the human as distinct singular do? I think it reminds us that the human has never been a stable category and yeah. that who gets included within the human is a question of power. Yeah. Um, but there's also um, the the idea that you can undo species difference mm -hmm. to think about gender difference, race and class. So it throws older questions into focus by unraveling the naturalness of categories like gender mm -hmm. or the natural of race. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it also allows us to understand the ways in which the human is formed through these relationships right. with other kinds of beings. So there's that question of how the human is separated into uh, racial class categories. But there's also the broader question of how humans are never formed alone, but are always formed through relationships and inter interactions with all kinds of other non-humans. With all kinds of other non-humans. So, so what is it to be human from this perspective? To be human from this perspective, and I'm going to paraphrase one of my favorite anthropologists, Anna Singh, is yeah. to recognize that to be human is always to be in an interspecies relationship. Okay. That, the, that, that human know. nature is yeah. essentially uh, a more than human relationship. Right. And to understand what it means to be human, we have to think through how that category has shifted over time, but also how that how the investment in separating the human from the non-human is one that um, has led to all kinds of problems. Yeah, problems. problems. Patriarchy, philogocentrism. Yeah, we got that. But I'm invested in, I'm very interested in. So what? What is the new world of desire that this opens up? Mm -hmm. What is the new possibility of being in the world that this enables? Mm -hmm. What are the sort of uh, ways in which we can start thinking about our agency in the world through this? Mm -hmm. For me, let's say, how can we think of architectural design agency mm -hmm. through such concepts? That's what I'm trying to do. So what, what So what do you think? How do you think about architecture and design through such concepts? Well, it may, it, it offers me an opportunity to rethink old shibboleths like Louis Kahn, mm -hmm. you know, talking to a brick. Mm -hmm. So the logo of my podcast now, if you go to my about page, it shows me talking mm. to a brick. Mm. And Louis Kahn used to ask, we have to ask a brick what it wants to be. Mm -hmm. And he said, when I asked the brick what it wanted to be, it said it wanted to be an arch. Mm -hmm. So, and we all thought yeah, this was that. a funny uh, sort of... Uh, uh, strange modernist uh, uh, narcissism mm -hmm. to think uh, you can speak for the brick. Mm -hmm. yeah, right? This is how I've always assumed it to be. Yeah. But through these categories, I can certainly start saying, oh, well, maybe the old man was actually talking to the brick mm -hmm. and had a certain connection. And that indeed, the whole point of architecture is to explore and express the human brick interrelatedness because mm -hmm. that's design because yeah. anybody can engineer a bridge yeah but you have to think with the materiality of the materials that you're working with there are yeah, constraints with, placed with. on yeah yeah on right. what humans can do alone that's right. right so any kind of engineering is a process of working with other kinds of beings and objects that's and working right. or, within or the limits that are set by that them way, yes yeah right so it's not it sort of offers a non heideggerian way to connect the reality of the things that we deal with. Mm -hmm. And I think it offers us a, a reminder that the ambit of human intentionality goes only so far. Mm -hmm. That human intention has to rub up against, be constrained by, and work with other right. kinds of intention, if you will, right. other kinds of instincts. That's um, right. And that, I think, is a really valuable uh, intervention that comes out of thinking in these ways. 
So I'm imagining myself in studio and I'm trying to suggest to a student, no, you must talk to the brick and the material and the stones. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I'm looking at that student looking back at me and thinking I'm cuckoo, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Well, so I'm trying to give them examples from Well, I've been taking from, a ceramics class study. recently yeah. and it's been really interesting to work with clay and to realize the difference between different kinds of clay. And I'm uh -huh. very much a beginner. Okay. But different forms of different kinds of clay yeah. work in different ways. They right. have different thickness. They uh, rise in particular ways. They hold together in very separate, in very distinct forms. Um, and that has been really interesting for me because I've had to reimagine what I want to make mm -hmm. according to the form of the clay that I'm working with. And there's always something unexpected that mm -hmm. happens. Right. Different kinds of clay fire differently. Mm -hmm. um, every object I make comes out differently and part of that is the chemistry of the clay yes. you know the ways in which the clay works against my fingers so it's really made me think in a very minute way outside of my usual sphere of intervention. So we teach that and that sort of lends itself from my perspective to the traditional mastery over the material mm -hmm. so there are masters who understand different kinds of clays and their chemical properties and and their, uh, you know, conductive strength, holding strength, so on and so forth. And then we sort of engineer amazing structures out of that. But that's not what you are talking about. No, I think what I'm talking about, actually, is that even masters mm -hmm. have to work with materials and have to learn the limits of those materials. And there's always an element of something unexpected uh, that can often frustrate the best of human intentions. Sure. So I've been thinking about this in a very different context with bovine flatulence. Bovine um, flatulence. Right, so oh, bovine flatulence. Bovine farts, you mean. Yes, and usually it's mostly burps. Right, but and this is where the methane comes and everybody talks about yes, it. Yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. So methane is a huge concern and right. bovine flatulence releases quite a, deal, a great deal of methane. Right. So a number of scientists across the world are trying to re-engineer cows so that they can be less gassy. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to feed them different things. And there was a very interesting newspaper article about some scientists in Europe who were trying to uh, redo cattle feed mm -hmm. and feed them different things. And it seemed to work for two months. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly the bacteria in the cow's body went back to producing flatulence. Okay. And so there, I think that points to the ways in which the human actor has to constantly work with unexpected non-human actors right. and that you know the best of engineering projects have an element of failure built into them because it's not human intention doesn't fully work in those ways you have quoted donna haraway again to say that in trying to figure out how we communicate or connect to non-human actors that communication is gestural mm -hmm. never literal always implicit Mm -hmm. a corporeal invitation to risk co-present, to risk another level of communication. Mm -hmm. So before we try and risk another level of communication with clay and brick, yeah. let's return back to animals for a little while. Yeah. And talk about risking levels of communication. And, and you're certainly having sex with an animal is a certain risk. Let's just go back. You've written the book in a very... Uh, proactively first-person voice mm -hmm. sense and I suppose maybe this is the how it's done in anthropology nowadays mm -hmm. so I'm very curious I mean you've put your own stories your own narratives your own engagement with the people that you're looking at here the animals you ran with some animals that scared the shit out of you this that and the yeah. other right mm -hmm. so tell us a little bit uh, why how, how did you get engaged with this question of interspecies relatedness was it just because you read this in theory in grad school or is the how far back can you go in your life to your let's say childhood mm -hmm. to when you first thought this was a good important question important thing for you yeah there are always multiple trajectories that you can find i've always been fond of animals mm -hmm. so that's definitely one um strand of my own personality that has opened up many of these questions mm -hmm. what does it mean to claim to know an animal right um can you can you actually know uh, across that kind of difference? Mm 
How did, what are why, the limits of that knowing? Were you five years old thinking about this question? Well, I had a dog growing up, so okay. I would think quite often about what he was thinking did and what he was feeling. Dog? I did all the time. Yes, and did but he it, say anything back to you? I think he did. Yeah, I think he yeah. did. He was quite through gestural means. Yeah. Through gestural means, through growling <coughs> when I would crawl under the bed with him. Yeah. You know, through all the other forms of um, of embodied communication, and that getting to know him was. A process and I look back at that now and I think about what it meant to get to know each other and how do you come to a stage where you can risk communication to use Haraway's words and the risks for me there are multiple right there's a risk of anthropomorphization which mm -hmm. is a question that many people raise sure. do you really yeah. can you really actually are we know? smart enough to talk to animals somewhere you said somebody said well there's yeah. Franz de Waal yeah, whose yeah. work I love and yeah. he has a new book out but are we smart enough to know how smart animals are yeah, yeah. Uh, asks us why anthropomorphism is a greater risk than what he calls anthropodenial, yeah. which I think is really a wonderful uh, term because one of the points he makes is that there is perhaps a greater hubris mm -hmm. in imagining that certain qualities are restricted to the human. Right, right, right. That that is a greater hubris than imagining that human qualities extend beyond humans right, to animals. Right, right, right. And I am really quite convinced by that. I think yeah. that obviously there are limits to knowing, there are mm. limits to translation, but these are also questions that come up when working with humans. Not all categories are easily translatable. Mm -hmm. It's hard to know what other humans are thinking. Mm -hmm. It's perhaps at a different <clears throat> level for animals, but I think there is, uh, it is worth it to let loose our creative, playful imaginations and to be playful. Right. in thinking through that, all the while recognizing that this is not a claim to speak for, that there are, yes, yes. that we are in many ways engaging in imaginative processes. But I think it's worth it not to be scared of the imagination. Yeah, so let's, let's take some risks here. Mm -hmm. Can you describe a time, uh, an experience, a gestural event, from your own pre-scholarly life mm -hmm. or extra-scholarly life where you felt you had a mistranslated communication with other species? Sure, I mean, you know, I've been... Besides <laughs> your own dog. I've been um, bitten by several dogs. Okay. And part of that, I think, <laughs> is mistranslation. Oh, yeah, you talk about, you know, hatred and, and, and other things. As also kinds of communication. Yeah, and also. those are risks too, right? Yeah, when yeah. you try and establish <laughs> communication, there are uh, perhaps the beings that you want to establish communication mm. with don't really want that communication with sure, you. Sure, sure. So I've certainly had multiple encounters in my childhood where I would go up to dogs and try and embrace and them. You. And sometimes they didn't want to be embraced and they bit me, which only seems fair um, if somebody's trying to force themselves on you. But that wasn't fair, didn't feel fair then, did it? Probably not, but uh, <laughs> I, it did, I did learn very quickly about how to establish communication right. and in what kinds of terms. Right, so it right. certainly taught me to be respectful and yeah, to yeah, think yeah. longer about that yeah. establishing that relationship. But <clears throat> we all have encounters like that in our lives when we're trying to work through our relationships with other beings. And I think whether it's working with machines and learning the ways in which certain machines work, Zen Buddhism and the art of motorcycle maintenance. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that uh, those questions are ones that we navigate in our daily lives. And I think that opening up the realm of what counts as acceptable scholarly work and bringing these questions into the realm of scholarship is a really important one. And thankfully, there's been this very long tradition now of doing that. Would you accept my sort of uh, love for my car, my beautiful Tesla, as part of this discourse? Yes, absolutely. Why you not? Sure? Well, you have your own relationship. And, you know, I'd be curious to hear you talk about how that works, how that intimacy works for you. For, I'm very much an anthropologist. For me, okay. these are questions that are worked out <coughs> right. ethnographically. I'm interested in, like, the particular instantiations of them right. across time and space. And so, yes, I would be very interested in hearing about your relationship. Well, most people would just describe it as a standard midlife male crisis. How would you describe it? I, yeah, I don't know. I, I describe it usually as a standard midlife male crisis, but I say, so what? That makes good sense to me. Mm -hmm. And and my Tesla and I have a very intimate relationship. What are the forms of that intimacy? Well, we, it's very comforting. I've told this story many times on this podcast, so the listeners are going to be pissed off. But anyway, 
my, in my <laughs> Audi TT, I had a Bluetooth system mm-hmm. which was motion activated. So that's the technical description. But the bottom line was that the moment I got into the car, mm-hmm. it would activate and connect to my phone. And then it, in a beautiful female voice, would say, connected. Mm-hmm. So that just made me felt really good. It sounds like a midlife male connection. <laughs> 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 And your new yeah. car doesn't have. And well, my new car doesn't do exactly that, but it does a bunch of other things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, but I do miss that old connection. Yeah, but you're forging new ones. But I'm forging new ones. We are developing a relationship, and uh, it, I, I feel happy every time I get into the car. Mm-hmm. So. There you go. But that's not the same thing as what you're talking about. No, I don't it's think. not. And I think there is something to be said about the difference between different kinds of non-humans and the difference between individuals even within species. Mm -hmm. You know, at many uh, times our conversation occurs at this very broad level where the non-human makes sense as a category, but it really doesn't. Because to think of a brick and an animal, even between animals, a goat and a leopard in the same way, doesn't make sense. And so I think there has to be some understanding of how this intimacy relatedness works with different kinds of beings and again to me that's a sort of ethnographic question but i'm wary of flattening right difference and assuming that against this category of human you can transpose this very capacious category of the non-human right we use it for convenience very often sure sure, sure. but i do think that there is something to be said for specificity and for acknowledging the difference between different kinds of beings Okay, so let's turn to one of the ancient, haloed, and deeply, from my perspective, in in, in the contemporary world, controversial uh, kind of inter-species related, and this is the idea of uh, animal sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And you have a full chapter on that, and you discuss it extensively in various ways. And that connects really well to architecture. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you look at the Greek temple, it's basically a institution set up for animal sacrifice, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and you look at the foundations of the Hindu temple, it's also an institution of sacrifice. You know, the, the old Vedis uh, of Arya times, etc. They were all sort of sites for sacrifice, basically, and mostly involved uh, animal sacrifice mm-hmm. of various kinds. Uh, but then there was also continuity. There was all kinds of sacrifices, and, and ultimately, sort of a, a longest spectrum of purusha, uh, human sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Architecture as the instrumentation of sacrifice is mm-hmm. a well-established uh, lineage. Mm-hmm. So I'm very interested in this idea of sacrifice. Let me say provocatively: Isn't it convenient to? substitute yourself with an animal yeah that's a question that the chapter begins with right uh and this is a question that many people there are asking and i want to take that seriously i think that question raises the bigger question of how do you account for your involvement in the death of another right um and what is what are the ethics of that can that be ethical yes and it's a difficult question i uh I don't think there's an easy answer. I think animal rights activists are asking this question. Um, Lots of ordinary people are disclaiming sacrifice because they're unwilling to accept the the ethical trade-off, if you will. Right. But I do want to consider seriously the idea that sacrifice doesn't preclude care, love, or grief, Mm -hmm. or even guilt, for that matter. Right. And I think in contemporary discourse, particularly within some of the animal rights discourse, there is a sense that sacrifice can only be understood as an act of senseless violence mm-hmm. against beings who are considered not sentient at all. Right. And I do want to push back against that and think about the ways in which sacrifice does activate and draw on relationships of labor and relationships of care for animals, and that the death of animals actually opens up, the killing of animals opens up a space for ethical thinking. And I'm interested as an anthropologist in what the nature of that ethical thinking is. It might be convenient, but it doesn't come without some form of reflection, intense critical reflection on human responsibility for animal killing. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't come without some attempt towards atonement. And there's a larger question of 
what does it mean to take life? But this is a question that has occupied people over millennia. Veena Das, uh, the anthropologist, writes about how this question of guilt for animal killing comes up in the Vedas. It does? Yeah. And uh, a what number What did they say? Of, well, uh, she argues that one of the questions that's raised there is, what does it mean to kill animals? Um, but she also points out that humans are also considered one of the categories of Pashu who mm-hmm. can be sacrificed. Mm-hmm. Right. So there is that sense that the distinction between human and animal is not quite stark there. Correct. But that um, there isn't any easy resolution in the Vedic texts as yeah. to how you atone for this. But there right. are discussions of care uh, for sacrificial animals. There are discussions of what human, what responsibility being involved in this killing then leaves for humans. What... Uh, what are the forms of connectedness and relatedness that emerge from being involved in that violence? Mm-hmm. So it's not, there's no resolution to that question as uh, there isn't in the book. Mm-hmm. But that question remains one that is very compelling. Mm. And it comes up in different forms, right? There are people who are refusing um, products that are tested in animals. But for instance, if you take antibiotics, you're killing off life. Sure. Right. Sure. So there, that the idea that um, one cannot take life at all mm. is a tricky one to enact. Mm-hmm. And so, what interests me is not so much the that the purity of that yeah. question, so but how people navigate that. that. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. But how people actually navigate those um, ethical conundrums that spring up around what it means to take life. How do you take it? And if you take it, how do you atone for it? Okay, but that's you're speaking very much as a you know that's a, uh, from a scholarly perspective as an anthropologist, and you can look at how we mm-hmm. as a your subjects in the real world, since I'm not an anthropologist, how we do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm also trying to push at how one could possibly imagine uh, another kind of architecture. Mm-hmm another kind of being in the world which re-articulates our traditional relationship to sacrifice, mm-hmm. right? What are we talking about here? Are we talking about re-verifying ancient sacrificial practices through a questioning of uh, sort of simple modernist shibboleths on sanctity of life? Mm-hmm. Or are we trying to get to another, you know, let's say post-feminist horizon in which one can think of of some other way in which all life Mm -hmm. is uh, engaged in some form or the other in uh, in sacrifice? Mm -hmm. I mean, how can, do you have any sense of what a, let's say a 21st century, a new temple might be in this uh, you 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 have a lot of pictures nice pictures of architecture everywhere mm-hmm. you show shrines you show cow sheds you show this yeah uh, you, there's a lot of architecture actually in visually in in your in your book and by sort mm-hmm. of anecdotal description mm-hmm. yeah i'm curious what do you think uh, as the architect i'm very interested in redesigning the hindu temple for instance mm-hmm. as a as a it has not been done the church has been significantly reimagined through secular modernism and then through post-secular modernism, and you know, so there are all kinds of discussions about it. But there's nothing, none, none, none about it, about a temple that I know of of any significance. There are a few sort of bad, abstracted Hindu temples in Bangalore and so on, mm-hmm. but uh, there, there isn't a sort of a, 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 a deep reading of it. Uh, I also do want to say, though, that the temple is not the only site of sacrifice. Okay. You know, there are, um, in this particular context, sacrifice happens um, in village, outside village homes. It happens deep in the forest, uh, especially for the sort of nightly sacrifice to angry beings who are ghost spirits, all kinds of... But is the location of where you do the sacrifice critical in that case? And yes, how it's done, and very much so. So if you do, you make a temporary little temple-ish thing to do that. You don't make a temple, but you leave a little rag, a red rag, marking the spot, marking the spot with a bell, 
um, but you don't leave a built structure sure, sure, other sure. than that. No, architecture doesn't have to be built yeah. and permanent, yeah. Right. So I think that question of what architecture you're redesigning and what the classical form has been mm-hmm. is an open one, mm. right? There are obviously sacrifices in some of the major temples, but there is also this whole rural architecture of sacrifice that is not focused on the temple. And so what would redesigning that look like? Well, traditionally, uh, uh, an altar or a vedi, and therefore by extension the entire temple, is simply an instrument that enables the purpose of the sacrifice to communicate to the non-human realms. But that's in certain tantric forms as well, in tantric architecture. Yeah, Mm -hmm. but the the temple as such is is that. It's the instrument, instrument or medium of non-human, human human to non-human communication. Mm -hmm. Whereas Devi Devtai Mm -hmm. or 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 the rest of the world, right? Yeah, that's the whole point of darshan Mm -hmm. and and temple working. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 a magic device Mm -hmm. to be able to do that. Right. Now you can call this yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. You can call you can call this superstition. You can say "Eh, whatever. It's Mm -hmm. not obviously. It's not actually doing that, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to imagine how one can rethink that as an instrument through this question of inter species relatedness as a sort of a new new theoretical view of things yeah and I, I mean i think you know there are multiple other nodes along which temples can be opened up the question of caste in india is really central a number of the larger temples especially are sites of caste power mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um and you know given that dalits have long been denied entry to multiple temples. Mm-hmm. That question yeah, of yeah, what yeah, sure. does a reimagined temple space look like is not only one that has to sort of taken into account. Okay, well that's an anthropocentric question. Yeah. I want interested in an interspecies question. All right. In that case, <laughs> I think the caste question is one that sort of remains important even within these discussions because for so long Dalits have been animalized. Yeah. Right? Oh, so okay. Thinking, yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, To me, I think that, again, to come back to what we were discussing at the start, I think the question of the animal opens up the ways in which animality has been used to undergird caste supremacy, Mm -hmm. racism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, my my, my father was big into animals. Mm -hmm. And he always started with the story of, uh, you know, when he was a kid. Well, his mother died young, so I think that's part of the equation. But that he grew up in a joint family. Mm -hmm. And it was, he was given the sort of task he felt because he didn't have a mother by his arms to, you know, milk the cow and look after the cow. He was mm-hmm. given the low job mm-hmm. while his cousins were given the better jobs. Yeah. But, uh, but he always would say that because of that, mm-hmm. he actually really developed a very great affection mm-hmm. for the family cow. Mm-hmm. Uh, and literally sort of became sort of a substitute Gauma's uh, mm-hmm. mother, mm-hmm. so that every time he left home or came home, who was this cow who was sort of tied to the pen outside the house was, uh, you know, would he was sure would get up and be excited to see mm-hmm. him. And now having read your book, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm sure that happened. Yeah, and he wasn't just making it up. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it did. <laughs> and yeah. it's real affection, mm-hmm. two way, right? Yeah. Uh, and he also tells the story of that when he was sort of designing Chandigarh with Kabuzi and Janare, etc. He said, well, why don't we have cows in, in people's homes? And mm-hmm. I think Janare or Cobb just said, we, do not go- we are not going to have animals in the <laughs> modern city. Yeah. So modernism has this sort of prohibition against uh, the animal. Right, and the desire to invisibilize, invisibilize the, the animal. animal right, yeah. only as meat and, and mm-hmm. dairy and so mm-hmm. on and so forth. And you see that in the moving of slaughterhouses, for instance, to the outskirts Outside. of the city. and yeah. So that has been successfully done. Mm-hmm. Even now in our sort of food security movement in the United States, we only talk of growing tomatoes and vegetables. You know, Nobody talks about bringing back the slaughterhouses into the apartments of high-rise buildings, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is, not you know... If Timothy you... Pacharad writes about this quite a bit, and I think you might find his work interesting. He um, talks about how the politics of sight works yeah. in slaughterhouses and what must be kept out right. of sight right. and what in this moment when slaughterhouses are trying to deal with the growing animal ethics movement, so um, does he what have... is brought into sight. 
So how, how would you propose uh, to us? So my father's solution was that the, the center of every neighborhood should be a, a animal farm. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, animals have to be communally mm -hmm. held and sent in the Minnesota for for sort of his technologist uh, yeah. Uh, uh, solution. I think that's a really interesting solution because it also firstly makes visible laboring animals mm -hmm. and the labor involved in making animals labor for you. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I think that then forces certain kinds of ethical reckoning. Does it really? I don't see that reckoning anywhere here in the West. I think people are trying to reckon with slaughter with uh, meat eating for instance and mm -hmm. there are multiple ways in which that reckoning takes place there's a question of environmental impacts of say beef mm -hmm. right which is a very uh, heavy industry mm -hmm. uh, but there are also questions of animal life and the sanctity of animal life so I think there are ways that there are reckonings but again as an anthropologist I'm interested in the political social historical context of those reckonings and the effects they have mm -hmm. But I wouldn't say that there aren't attempts to reckon. Okay, so let's say we have had the reckoning and now we want to reimagine the slaughterhouse in Seattle, mm -hmm. in your neighborhood in Capitol Hill. Um, that's beyond me, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I would be very happy to hear your thoughts. But, uh, yeah. but one of the, I mean, one of the things that Patera talks about is the importance of invisibilizing hmm. um, slaughter yeah. right to contemporary slaughterhouses right. and the ways in which that act of making invisible occurs and I think we have to ask ourselves what happens if we make it visible now what form That's that takes I... is uh, is contingent and open but I do think that what it means to make death visible and yeah. make killing visible right is a really important question it's a very important question. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. That's that's my sort of one of the big takeaways from, you know, because all the sacrifices you describe in this book, killing was very visible. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole community gathered and then the sacrifices were done and everybody saw it and you sort of handed over the animal and so on and so forth. Yeah, and I find it interesting that legal attempts to uh, control sacrifice have invested so heavily in the idea that its concealment is important. So the High Court's judgment in Uttarakhand mm. uh, on sacrifice declared that uh, sacrifice in urban areas could not take place because it would have to adhere to slaughterhouse rules. Mm -hmm. So it would need to take place in a shed and it would the animal would have to be killed for the purposes of provisioning food. Mm. And in rural areas where they recognize that slaughterhouse rules are harder to apply because mm. they're mostly for urban contexts. They stipulated that the sacrifice of animals would have to take place in a separate area mm -hmm. that had been set aside right. for that purpose. Yeah. And so even there you see this modernist desire to to set aside, to invisibilize. To invisibilize. Because there is something shocking, I think, to a to the modernist eye about the visible spectacle. Yeah. yeah. So, so to, towards the end here, you know, I, I want to ask, you know, this invisibilization of the meat producing animal mm -hmm. and its, uh, you know, derangement of its labor and mm -hmm. sort of inhumanity of its ge daily genocide. What, do you think there's a constitutive relationship between that invisibilization and sort of the, let's say, fetishization of pets? Mm -hmm. in uh, dogs and cats mm -hmm. in the domestic life of people? Yeah, um, there's a historian called Harriet Ritvo who mm -hmm. has um, several very interesting pieces on the emergence of pet keeping mm -hmm. as a distinct domain. Right. And one of the things she notes is that it is fairly recent, um, and she is looking at Victorian England, mm -hmm. that the idea of keeping pets in a particular way emerges, right? The idea that the pet is something that doesn't labor, right? for instance. Yes. So your cat or dog is not, not a laboring animal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's uh, relatively recent because yeah. for very long cats and dogs were also laboring animals. They cats were, were mousers, right? yeah. dogs would take care of flocks, they would do yeah. other kind of work and yeah, you see yeah, that yeah. now yeah, yeah. in the formation of breeds except yeah. that that work has been stripped away yeah, yeah, yeah. 
from um, from pet keeping. Yeah. So I do think that there is something significant about that separation between leisure animal and laboring animal. Right. And the the fetishization of one yeah. has also made easier the effacement and the invisibilization Correct, yes. of the other. Yeah. So I think there is something there is an interesting connection there. There is a connection, yeah. isn't there? So yeah. there's a problem with our dogs and cats. And I also think that there is a with that separation, you also see other kinds of formations of human difference emerge. So a lot, a lot of the slaughterhouses in the U.S. Uh, are staffed by undocumented workers, sure. and their labor is then employed. Invisibilized, similarly. In, yeah, invisibilized um, and also completely unregulated. Right, mm-hmm. they work in horrific conditions, are often threatened by their employers to have ice called on them. And you look at pet keeping and you look at the billions of dollars spent on that industry and the ways in which that industry is also sort of racialized. Right? Right, you think right. about you know, which pets are allowed and which ones, thinking about pit bulls, for instance. Mm-hmm. And there's um, the work of one person in particular, Holland Weaver, that I'm thinking of, who writes a lot about the ways in which American discourses and practices, legal and social around pit bulls, speaks to the ways in which race uh, is formed in the U.S. I see. And so I think there are also, once, once you're thinking of these distinctions between leisure and labor animals, also all other kinds of interesting formations of race and gender that um, erupt around those. And so undoing that distinction also helps us think about those. I see. Those disturbing formations of power. All right. We are going to think about this for a long time. Thank you for being on Architecture Thank you so Talk. much for having me. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. This is Vikram Prakash, your host, and our producer is the one and only Sammy Prouty, a graduate student of architecture here at the University of Washington in Seattle. I hope you all enjoyed our conversation, and if you did, please do take a moment to subscribe and to rate us on iTunes. See you next time. Take care. Goodbye.